I would like to welcome Les Lancaster. Thank you. Thank you for that in, in, introduction, Amber. Um, so the, the, the title of the talk is, as you can see, the quest for consciousness. And in using that title, I'm really wanting to convey two approaches. The term, the quest for consciousness, can be used in the sense that we're trying to understand the nature of consciousness. The quest to understand consciousness. Um, and the second sense is, I think, the, 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 the more transpersonal, the more spiritual. The notion that there is a quest for what we might call a more enriched state of consciousness, maybe a higher state, I would say. And this, as I say, is where the more spiritual and the transpersonal, as Amber said in the introduction, um, where that comes in. So I'm sure everyone knows that, that the, the quest to understand the nature of consciousness has really come to the fore uh, over recent years. Um, the two aspects of the title in some ways bring together uh, two aspects of myself. And that is, I began my research career in the area of cognitive neuroscience. Uh, and that quest in the first sense to understand the nature of consciousness, I think that is largely being spearheaded by neuroscience, uh, understanding how the brain is involved in conscious states. Uh, and I continue to be very involved with that, that approach. But that's not the main aspect I want to talk about this afternoon. It's the second, and, and uh, the, my, where, where in the interest more in the transpersonal and the spiritual, as the title of, of this talk is saying, that second sense in, in questing for something deeper and more meaningful. And I think what is distinctive in the approach I adopt is that, that I think that our answer in the first sense to what is the nature of consciousness will never be complete without this sense of the spiritual basis. And, and that's really what I want to convey in this talk. I want to try and uh, convey why it is that uh, an approach to consciousness that does not include the spiritual and the transpersonal will not be a complete approach. To start, let's just think about the term consciousness. And you may well know already that the, the, the word itself does not have such a long history. It depends what one's scale is in a sense. But uh, on this slide, I'm showing you a time scale. So when, when do we find the word consciousness first occurring? In actual fact, it starts in the 17th century. Uh, and of course, the first question you might ask is, well, does that mean that people had no conception of what we today call consciousness before the 17th century? I will suggest that that is not the case. Rather, the earlier conceptions of what consciousness is were much more bound up with the spiritual uh, connotations of, of that term. So just briefly, and out of interest, we can look at the way the term consciousness uh, was originally used. And in fact, the, 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 the word itself, conscire, which is coming from Latin, has the connotation of knowing with. In the first place, as it were, knowing with oneself, a, a, an inner knowing that one is one's own uh, witness to something you know. And then, uh, again, the early usage, knowing with others. In fact, this was a consciousness to, with someone else. And it wasn't until later that the way that we use the term consciousness today started to come into usage. In, as you can see, 1690, um, uh, John Locke is writing that consciousness is the perception of what passes in man's own mind. Much more akin to the way we use the term today. And moving forward, then that consciousness is a state of being. 
coming very much into the modern usage. Uh, we have a quote here from, from Dickens. Uh, when the fever left him and consciousness returned, he awoke to find himself rich and free. A state of consciousness as opposed to a state of, of, of sleep or fever. Um, and then moving much more into our own period in the 1960s, with the great interest in exploring consciousness, maybe through drugs and other use, other ideas. Um, so we have the sense that consciousness can become, in some sense, expanded. Again, a, a, a new idea in terms of the use of the word. The question I'm asking, then, is th does this exhaust what we mean by consciousness? And again, prior to 1600, was there no conception? I want to explore that by engaging with a little uh, experiential exercise with you. It's, a, it's an exercise using the breath, and obviously the center of our breathing is in the chest area. So let's just engage in a little focused breath. And as you breathe in, be aware of the chest expanding and a sense of the air filling the chest region. very relaxed and easy state. But we're going to make this slightly more complicated by moving the breath. Now at this point, in a sense, maybe we leave behind the immediate physiology of breathing and take a leap into imagination and a deeper sense of our own bodies. The breath is coming into the chest region, the center being the heart. You're breathing into the heart, opening up that channel. And then as you breathe down, begin to push from the chest downwards into the, into the lower region, the belly. And sounding inwardly, a humming sound. So as I say, you can make that sound inwardly or outwardly if you want, but the main thing is a state of being that we're trying to cultivate. And as you push the breath down in that way, with the out breath, be aware of the element of water in the lower region, in the belly region. This kind of an exercise can be continued for a, for a long time. I'm just trying to give a little flavor here, so we'll move on. Um, with, so now, as you breathe in, again, breathing in into in the chest, obviously, and be aware of the center, the heart. But this time, as you breathe out, direct the breath upwards, through the head. And another sound, a sound we associate with the hissing of flames of fire. So the sounds, which as I say, you can cultivate inwardly yourself, is a humming, and a hissing sound. And as you push the breath up, 
Be aware of fire. So the head is associated with fire. So now we can see the whole cycle. Firstly, the breath comes in and down with water. Breath comes in and it sends it up. Fire. Now, I'm not going to continue this in a prolonged sense. This is a little meditative kind of practice that you can develop and, and work with. Let me just say that uh, I've run this kind of a practice over many, many years, over a prolonged period of time with all kinds of different groups of people. And there's no question that it affects one's state of consciousness. Where does the practice come from? Well, that comes in the next slide. This is, uh, it comes from a text which is nearly 2,000 years old from the, the Kabbalistic or the Jewish mystical tradition, looking at certain of the important letters within the Hebrew alphabet. And there's a whole mysticism surrounding those letters, which we can't go into now, but very simply, Three letters. One letter, the first letter is Aleph and represents air. Another letter in Hebrew, the Mem, represents water and has that humming sound. And then the third letter, the letter Shin in Hebrew, hisses and stands for fire. These are the three letters. They won't be familiar to you unless you know the Hebrew, but I just want to point out these correspondences. So there's not only the experiential dimension that we can explore if you use that kind of a practice for a more prolonged duration. But the fact is, in the Hebrew language, uh, the Aleph stands for Avir, which means air. The Mem stands for Mayim, which means water. And the Shin stands for Esh, which means fire. So it's there in the language. And in addition, you can see what I've written, that... The hissing sound is like total sound. Any physicists amongst you will know that white noise, we call it in physics, yes? White noise includes all the different frequencies of sound. Uh, whereas the humming is the purest kind of sound. And of course the, the aleph is no sound. Working with those ideas... Why do I bring this? Well, it's an interesting practice in its own right. And like I say, if you, if you spend some time exploring that, I mean, when I work with people with this, they, they visualize intense fire. Or, or for example, the, the water in the lower region, you can bring it to a kind of stillness, like a still lake. And it brings a very uh, peaceful state of consciousness. The fire can be very um, active, or again, it can die away, just glowing embers. A very, very uh, poignant state of consciousness. Now, okay, you can work with that. The point I'm making is that this is nearly 2,000 years old. It was written down 2,000 years ago. Of course, these traditions go way, way back. Many of them were only rediscovering recently. And I have no doubt whatsoever, of course, that these people 2,000 years or more ago were engaging in different states of consciousness. So to, to, to look at the word and say, well, where does the word come from, etymologically or historically, doesn't do the subject justice. The fact is that probably all the different forms that we relate to in, in relation to consciousness were there in ages gone by. But of course, and this is the key point, they were understood in this spiritual context. It's a question of soul. It's a question of spirit. And that is the area that is so often missing in the first sense of quest for consciousness. My friends studying the brain, studying cognitive science, 
too often lose sight of that inner quality, that transpersonal quality. The fact that the word consciousness has been used in different ways once it came into usage in the, as I said, in the 17th century. In fact, the, 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 you can, studying words is always very interesting because so much of our experience is bound up with words and language. So the, the 17th century was a time of great change. I don't want to get too involved in the history here, but it's been said, I think, quite rightly, that what's new in the 17th century is a shift in, in our worldview towards the importance of process. From an interest in, in, in more static situations, we can find a period of great change. And of course, that great change has just accelerated over the centuries since, and in our day as well. Um, and, and these different shades of meaning about what consciousness is, I think comes down to us in our quest to understand consciousness in recognizing that there are in fact different dimensions by what we mean by the word consciousness. And this is what I want to illustrate in, in, in a series of slides here. So you can see three words on this slide. Accessibility, self, and phenomenality. These are the three terms which I think are really crucial to understand what consciousness is. Uh, and I want to explore them in turn. Self. One of the areas that has been researched is what, what is known sometimes as states of flow. When you're, when you're really engaged in something that, that, that uh, embraces the whole of you, you know, it's, it's, it's a hobby that you're intensely engaged in, or you're climbing a mountain, there's nothing else there, that the, the challenge of the, of the moment. You, you move into the present, you're in the now. And where's self at that moment? In a sense, it's not there. It's um, the sense of I can disappear. In those very precious moments, uh, this is a fact of experience. I don't think I need to spell this out. You know, when you think about those moments that were most intensely pleasurable, what, what sense of I was present? The answer probably is that it was a kind of no self, as illustrated in this diagram. The Buddhists talk a great deal about no self. The self is really just a construction. And that's a, a, an idea you find through most of the spiritual traditions. And it's also an idea that is well developed in cognitive neuroscience. It feels like I is very real, or self is very real. But actually, it's a construct that the mind creates retrospectively to make sense of experience. And it can get in the way. Uh, at the other pole, where I, I've written on this slide, all self. A sense of being so expanded, as it were, that the whole universe is part of you. And again, if you read mystical traditions, you find those kinds of expressions. And again, people I work with, they have had those kinds of experiences. It's not an egocentric experience. But it's an experience which is incredibly and profoundly moving. Some would put it in the sense of becoming divine. Others would say that God is within us, in any case. The sense of I varies. That's the key point here. And that relates to the second dimension of accessibility. Think about it. What can you access? A good example here is when you wake up with a dream. Of course, we, all, we know that, um, that, that, that we dream a great deal more than, um, than, than we remember. 
But sometimes we wake up, some of us more dream, remember dreams more than others. You wake up with a dream in your mind, and you, you know, think, oh, that was interesting. I think um, I want to tell so and so about that. And uh, later on, you, you meet the so and so, and suddenly you're kind of trying to bring back the dream, it's not there. It's as if it's just fallen down a hole. In fact, we can train ourselves to be more able to recollect our dreams. But it's just an example for us to, to make that point, that things are more or less accessible. And that is a defining feature of consciousness. So, uh, in, 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 um, obviously in uh, psychological terms, we might talk about unconscious states. Obviously something is non-accessible. And the, the point that my own research, and that of many others, will suggest that the state of I, or self, is a key feature in that situation. Which is why in this slide, I try to indicate that the construction of I varies. Sometimes it's more inclusive, sometimes it's less inclusive. So, in this slide, to see the, it can expand. When a person experiences what they might describe as an expanded state of consciousness, and like I said earlier, this, this is something that came in through the, 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 the explosion of interest in the 1960s. What expanded? The field of vision? The intensity of vision? The sense of being connected with something larger that brings about that expansiveness? Or your own sense of self? These are all bound together. The sense of self is invariably present in our experience of consciousness. Of course, we talk about self-consciousness. In other words, the more reflective we are, the more the sense of self is crucial. Let me demonstrate this point about accessibility in another way. I'm going to present something on the screen here. So if you're looking at the screen, as it said, what did you see? Did you see anything? Okay, anyone care to say what the cards were? Any gamblers amongst us? Two fives and an ace. Five hearts. Five hearts. Five hearts. Five hearts. Five hearts. Pretty good. You're obviously very present. So another look. What was the five? What suit was the five? Yeah. It's an old trick. This goes back from the psychology studies a long, long time ago. Uh, in that slide, the, um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the suits are reverse in color. So the five was not the five of spades. It was a five of hearts, but the hearts have been drawn black. Okay, it's a little, you know, a little trick. But the point is that we have great difficulty seeing that. I showed you three times. And the exposure wasn't that brief. Uh, it wasn't as if you couldn't really see it. You could see it. The fact is that we have great difficulty seeing that which is not expected. We live in a world of expectations. All the time, psychologically speaking, we are, as we're planning and predicting. And for us to become conscious of what is really there, that can be quite tricky. Sometimes talk about moments of awareness. It can happen 
with intense meditation. Sometimes just out of the blue. A person has what we might describe as a kind of opening experience. And the automaticity that is normally there in the way that we see the normal, maybe it's over, it's transcended in that moment. These are the kind of experience that, that, that are the substance of transpersonal psychology. And, uh, and there's a huge literature, and it's, uh, it's not something I'm going to go deeply into here, but most people, unless they're particularly blinkered, I would say, most people recognize these ideas. And of course, you just have to look into some of the texts in the areas of spirituality and mysticism to see what's happening. I said there were these dimensions of consciousness. We talked about self, we talked about accessibility. There's a third term. The term I use is phenomenality. And that is the hardest of all, I think, to convey. If, for those of you who've uh, looked into the study of consciousness, you may have heard the, the, the word qualia. The, the experience itself. In other words, if, if we're looking at um, a flame, there's a candle in front of you and that's flame, we can describe what is there, the whiteness of the candle, maybe the experience of the warmth coming from the flame. These are facets of experience. We can look into the brain and say, well, okay, the whiteness of the candle, I can see something about how the neurons are dealing with the frequency of light, but that's not the, the same as the experience itself. The fact is that we do not know where the experience comes from. We don't understand. There is no one, believe me, because I've been involved in the research field, and so on, there, was, there is no one who can answer that question in terms of the science of consciousness. Many will live in, in hope and expectation that delving further and further into the brain will uh, help us to answer that question. Uh, my own view is that that may be the wrong place to be looking. This inner quality, the, uh, the essence of consciousness, maybe it's just a fundamental reality. It's, 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 it's what, in a sense, maybe it's what the universe is made of. Just like astrophysicists will say, well, uh, I don't know, 90% of the, of the universe is dark matter, for those of you who kind of follow these developments. Well, what is it? No one can say what it is. We have to infer that it's real. We're really reaching the limits of scientific study here. And I think that's part of the challenge of consciousness. Really, this question I've raised, moving from uh, the, the, these dimensions and thinking especially about qualia or phenomenality, the experience and how to understand that, th this is where we move into the, the region of what has been, I think, aptly described as paradigm war. Any study must happen within the context of a paradigm. And I mention this term because it's come out recently, because, uh, just uh, uh, there's been a lot of controversy recently uh, surrounding something you may have come across. I think one of the more popular sites on the internet is, the, is TED. Uh, they have wonderful uh, educational talks. Uh, there was an episode very recently where uh, uh, some would say there was an element of censorship. Certain authors, Rupert Sheldrake, some of you may have heard of, uh, Graham Hancock, another one, um, their talks were removed. Why? Because it was felt that their work was pseudoscience. Now, that's not the subject I really want to go into, but what ensued was a lot of controversy about, uh, 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 about what qualifies as genuine science. And if you delve into this quest to understand consciousness, 
inevitably that's where you end up thinking well what actually what are the what are the appropriate ways for us to answer this quest what what kind of ways of knowing and science is probably the most potent and powerful way of knowing that we, we have devised but for certain questions that paradigm may be in need of change and I, on this slide I'm just illustrating some extremes of the paradigm very famously Francis Crick writing about his what he called the astonishing hypothesis really trying to reduce everything to the brain you, your joys and your sorrows your memories and your ambitions your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behaviour of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules it's not the only way of seeing things. So I quote here from my own uh, work in the book I wrote on approaches to consciousness. Statements about consciousness are quintessentially statements of belief. I don't need to read the whole of that extract. Uh, you can read it yourselves. People bring their beliefs to the question in, in this quest for consciousness. Uh, so if someone says well of course consciousness is just a product of the human brain uh, as Francis Crick did for example and many others in that, in that paradigm you must ask yourself what is their belief system that leads in that direction technically we'll call that physicalism or maybe materialism these are not the only paradigms and there's another point really when we ask questions about consciousness, I think the heart of the question is about value. What are the values that we associate with the quest for consciousness? Does it have an impact? If we think, as some do, that the essence of consciousness is something to do with computation, the, the, the neurons doing some kind of computation or even in a computer computation happening then ultimately maybe uh, a robot will be conscious what kind of a world will we be bequeathing to our children and our children's children of course this is the area of science fiction I think slightly differently I think firstly we need to look at all the evidence if there were evidence saying the essence of consciousness was about the brain and nothing else, fine, if there was evidence, but there's not. So we firstly, we look at the evidence and we have to make sensible choices. Secondly, in the situation where evidence doesn't tell us everything, we must say, what is the impact of the belief system that's at work here? And as far as I'm concerned, a belief system that reduces everything to physicality is not the belief system that gives me the greatest value. I'm not preaching fundamentalism, but to recognize that the spiritual dimension it's even difficult to kind of convey exactly because a lot of ideas of spirituality are also a bit cloudy. But that dimension that opens up into realms of enriched experience, that dimension is part of my value system and I think it's the value system that is important in the study of consciousness. So that's why, in addition to my early career in cognitive neuroscience, I, at this stage of my career, I'm engaged with transpersonal psychology, which is that area of psychology that can meaningfully approach these great ideas from the spiritual, mystical traditions, people's experiences of in which states and so on. And that point about value is not just in isolation, it's not anti-scientific. In this slide, I'm asking the question, which better represents the nature of our human reality as indicated by neuroscience? Good science. Is it this? Okay, this was an uh, illustration from the work of Descartes a long time back. 
showing kind of mechanistic uh, idea. The, the 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 fire is heating a fluid in the in the channel, which has an effect in the brain. It's a mechanism. Here's another slide with a great piece of art. Yeah, Alex Gray, which you might class as new agey, uh, fanciful thinking, but. Apart from the fact that I rather like the image, but that's just a question of aesthetics, this, the, the, what is being conveyed about the interconnectivity of everything, the resonance, the sense of being in connection in a more profound way, those ideas are not just aesthetics in a picture. They do follow from work in neuroscience, and work in quantum physics, astrophysics. This is the paradigm that we're moving into. And it has huge impact on our understanding of consciousness. So now, bringing these threads together, let me try to identify the key aspects of spiritual and mystical states of consciousness. I want to suggest that many forms of, of uh, spiritual or mystical practice are effectively training the body-mind. And at the same time, there's another aspect to them, which is that of connecting with something larger than oneself. There's been a lot of interest over recent years in the area of mindfulness. So I would imagine that everyone who's watching this would have an interest in that area. Drawing from spiritual practices, often associated with Buddhism, but Buddhism is not the only tradition that, that extols what, what we convey in, in the term mindfulness. In relation to what I said before, um, mindfulness is a question of stopping the automaticity of the mind. Uh, developing compassion might be another aspect of training the body-mind. So I'm not... I'm not, I'm not explaining every word that I'm putting on this slide. You can take it away and think it, about it more. Uh, but those just exemplify this first aspect of these spiritual traditions. They are valuable, as research is increasingly showing, in enhancing our state of being in terms of health, in terms of well-being, in terms of creativity, for example. The other side, connecting with something larger, all these spiritual traditions in their, in their original formulations held this to be crucial. Clearly, theistic traditions would be talking about connecting with the God, um, achieving a state of union with the divine. That there is something larger in our day, some of the study of the, the first aspect, training the body-mind through mindfulness, there's a tendency to detach that from these other quality of connected with something larger. That's a product of the paradigm that I've been criticizing. That you can somehow pull an idea like mindfulness out of its spiritual context and hold on to its full value. I don't think that that is the case, although I have interesting discussions with uh, colleagues who may think in those ways. The connection with something larger, well, at these terms, again, I'm not going to go into in, in great detail, um, but the sense of union, the sense that there's something beyond the individual scale of consciousness, um, prophetic states, for example, that uh, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism talk a great deal about this state uh, that we're, uh, of prophecy, and in these systems it doesn't just mean telling the future or something, it means achieving an expanded and, and a richer state of consciousness expanded in the sense of being connected with something larger than self. So these are the, uh, the, these are the ways that I would analyze such states. Uh, what I think is the key to understanding both of those aspects, in other words, sort of opening the gate to research the entirety of spiritual and mystical uh, work, uh, are these points I've just brought up. Accessing what we call the unconscious 
and also harnessing the power of imagination. I think if you look at it, and again, we can talk a great deal about the research in this area, but I don't think we have a great deal of time to go into this, but there is a lot of research. I think that it's those two aspects, connecting with the unconscious and developing a disciplined, focused way of using imagination, they're at the core of, of those ideas in these spiritual and mystical traditions. For example, um, what is the unconscious? You know, we slip into a very easy way of using words. Oh, everyone knows. Yeah. Freud talked about the unconscious. Dream? Oh yeah, that's about something happening with the unconscious. Well, for myself, and I know others that I, that I, I respect their work, might want to say, well, in a sense, that level that we can connect with, which is greater than ourselves, greater than our normal sense of consciousness, in a sense that is conscious. It's a greater consciousness. It's not un-anything. Now, we get caught up in some terminology here if we're not careful. But simply put, some great writers have suggested that what we think of as the divine is really found in the construct we have made of the unconscious. The deeper connotation of mind. And all the practices that are bequeathed to us through these wonderful spiritual and mystical traditions, in some, state, in some sense, open us up to that larger sphere of mind. The study of these areas falls out in the ways I indicated on the slide. So training the body-mind, ideas of attention, for example, which seem to be right at the core of all meditative practices, uh, cognitive neuroscience has a great deal to say about which parts of the brain are active and uh, what's the time course of different kinds of effects through meditation, uh, how does that relate to healing states and so on. Um, the more the, uh, connected with something larger is much more the domain of comparative religion and mysticism. Two areas that I am very involved in, um, in, in my own career, what brings them together, I would claim, and this is almost my definition of transpersonal psychology, is transpersonal psychology. Transpersonal psychology is really in a superordinate position to in include these, uh, these other areas because it, 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 transpersonal psychology is the, ha is, is the one area of psychology that, in a sense, um, treats the mystical traditions with respect. It doesn't just try to squeeze their ideas into a limited paradigm. So that's the, really the core of what I wanted to say in this quest for consciousness. Let me now just mention how this comes together in the area that I teach, which is a, a, a master's program in consciousness, spirituality, and transpersonal psychology. Um, so the details you can see here, and uh, you can look at the details on, on the website at www.transpersonalstudies.org.uk. On this slide, I just want to run through the areas that we study on this course. I don't want to take a lot of time, um, but it's the, the reason for doing it, not just to, to, to say about the course itself, but it's these areas that I see as being essential to a, full, a fully realized quest for consciousness. So I've all made clear, I think, already how consciousness studies, which embraces the scientific, the cognitive, and so on, needs, it, th that work needs to be integrated with that of transpersonal psychology, which is much uh, larger in scale. And obviously studying mindfulness, we talked about, these all fall into place in relation to what I've been saying. Uh, creativity and transformation. When I said before about this central role of imagination, using visualization or uh, embodied movement to explore 
the deeper connotations of what the mind is, because the mind, it seems to me, is not something that's tucked into the brain. It's the whole of us, and it goes beyond the body, as well as embracing the body. Um, Kabbalistic psychology is an area that I specialize in because I'm particularly interested in the Kabbalistic tradition and looking at that in the, the terms of psychology. Uh, that's my training, I'm a psychologist. Uh, transpersonal models of mind uh, that, that we need to understand. When we talk about, inverted commas, the unconscious, how does that pan out in terms of our quest to achieve enriched states. So, for example, the way that Jung brings in not only the notion of a personal or conscious, but that there is a collective realm to the mind. These sorts of ideas which, which are formulated in, in a, a, a range of models of the mind. And the importance of that in therapy, hugely important. So this is another area that comes into our course. Uh, many that I will talk to, many therapists that I work with, uh, they increasingly recognize the importance, if not just for themselves, but also from their clients, most importantly, of recognizing spiritual experiences and how, you know, putting those to one side for the therapeutic hour is totally the wrong thing. Achieving a higher state, a more enriched presence entails often making connection with these spiritual and transpersonal ideas. Uh, we, we teach research design because if you're going to do your own research, of course you need to understand the forms of, of research methodology. But not just the limited paradigm of traditional science, more holistic approaches, qualitative studies, um, areas where the transpersonal and the spiritual perspective are increasingly impacting on the ways we do things in, in our professions, in, 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 in our environmental concerns. So here, for example, management and spirituality, quite a buzz area at the present. Ecology, even more important. We have a responsibility not only for ourselves and those around us, but for our world. And I think that a full realization of those responsibilities entails a transpersonal perspective. And that a student should be encouraged to develop their own research. That's so important for a postgraduate program such as this. So that's where I'll leave you. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. Again, it's simply building on what I call the quest for consciousness, building on that to recognize the incredibly exciting stage that we're at. Because I think that, you know, people said we're at a, it's like a, a new renaissance. Uh, I think there's a lot of mileage in that. And the paradigm has changed, and the paradigm is moving into a, a more open, more enriched, more holistic approach. And then how that comes into the areas that I'm involved in, my own research, my writing, and the, 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 I, I've joined forces with some very uh, worthy colleagues around the globe to, to teach in this online uh, course. Thank you. I don't know if, if there are any questions, of course, I'm interested to, to answer those. <laughs> well, I'm interested to answer that question. <laughs> I, I've written a number of books. Um, the one I quoted from there uh, is called Approaches to Consciousness, subtitle, uh, The Marriage of Science and Mysticism, which I think the title sums up basically what I've been talking about. Uh, I have another book I'm, I wrote more recently called The Essence of Kabbalah, so that's where I've gone into a particular uh, mystical tradition. And uh, I'm, I'm working on a book now um, about Kabbalistic psychology. Right. 
So this course, this particular course, is an online course. So we have students around the globe. And uh, so, so the practical side of it, as far as you know, the online work, is a course we, are, we, in, we require people to engage in integral practice in one form or another. So part of the course is, is to set up a program of work which many of the students use, uh, they get into um, being in nature as part of that. They will need to some kind of meditative or spiritual work, uh, some, time of, some kind of compassion-based work, and so on. And, and that's part of, of what, we, what, what the students are doing, and, and very much what they're sharing. We, we, you know, we share that and the fruits of that. Uh, what we try and do also is to have at least uh, some time in the summer where we can come together, uh, and that obviously is highly experiential. But not everyone can do that. I mean, some, you know, some people uh, connecting to the course from, uh, from distant lands, and you know, they're, they're very grateful that there's this facility, which, of course, is connected with the new paradigm I was talking about, that we can, you know, th this way of teaching is not just a question of throwing things onto the web and saying, well, okay, there you are, if you go write an essay or whatever. You know, it's highly interactive. You know, I mean, there's this webinar, that, that is, is going out and, and people can be there in real time or, or you know, asynchronously. Uh, it's, it's great to be teaching such a broad community. And I think, i just add finally, it's not directly answering your question, but it's just as far as what I said, that my involvement in setting up this course is very much about trying to build a community, a learning community, which has these values that I've been talking about at its core. That's very exciting. I certainly get a mixture. Um, I, I think the bottom line, I, I, it, it, your question can be interpreted in different kinds of ways, right? But the bottom line, I would say, if someone is a hard-nosed a hard physicalist, in other words, someone who thinks there's nothing more to consciousness than what the neurons are doing, that, that person is probably... In fact, I have had one or two students in that, and they, you know, they may be changed, they've shifted in their approach. But by and large, the kind of people who are attracted to this approach are going to be those who um, have in their own experience a sense that there is a larger scale to be, to be investigated. Thank you. Good questions. <laughs> All right. Yes, of course. Yeah. So his, his work is a good example of, of the work that we'll be studying, that we study on this course. As a course, the, you know, the, the postgraduate course we're talking about then, uh, it, it, what we want is that the students will have a, an overview of all aspects of the, this field. So, of course, I and the colleagues I work with will certainly teach Ken Wilber's approach. So th there's no question that, uh, that that's a crucial approach and there's a great deal of wisdom in that approach. If you ask me, me personally, then I have my own view. So, for example, um, I, I think that there's a, a kind of hierarchical uh, approach in the way that Ken Wilber looks at things, and I think that he undervalues certain aspects of the uh, mystical traditions in the theistic traditions. And that, that, you know, that, I mean, I could argue the point. It's a whole sort of scholarly debate in that area. Um, so I, at, at some point, although I hugely value a lot of the work and the writings that, he, that Ken has produced, at some point, speaking for myself, I would part company with, with the way he arranges ideas in his hierarchy of levels of consciousness. But that's the stuff of debate, that's the stuff of progress. And as I say, the important thing on a course like this 
is that the students should see all approaches. That's what we try to achieve. It's happening. You know, uh, I first became interested. I, my career in psychology began, I don't know, nearly 40 years ago. And I wanted to research in areas of consciousness. I was already interested at that time in, in issues of mysticism, for example. But um, it was very, very hard to find an academic department in psychology that would be open to this kind of approach. Um, 30 years later, going back 10 years, it already changed hugely. Today, I mean, I mentioned research into mindfulness, for example. But it's, it's one of the most burgeoning fields there is. So nothing stays static. This is progress. Um, if you ask me again, personally, what do I think about the research in mindfulness? I intimated in, in, the, in the talk. I think that, there, that we need to embrace a larger sense of what spirituality is there within those traditions. And I think there are dangers in kind of isolating a certain kind of approach and studying that scientifically and so on. But, you know, that, that's, a, that's a discussion we could have. It's an interesting discussion. And again, it's the kind of discussion that I would encourage in students on the program. You know, they're, 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 not, they're not to be clones of my way of thinking, far from it. Um, so it's a good example to say that things have changed. Now, so the, answering your question, things have already changed. I would never have believed 20, 30 years ago that there would be a journal called, well, let me get it right, the Journal of Management, Spirituality and Religion. Never. I would not have believed that. And now it's, a, you know, it's an important journal. And many other journals which also have those kind of titles. So it changes. The, 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 the really interesting question in what you're asking goes back to the question of paradigm. In other words, all of these areas that are increasingly recognized, management and spirituality, health and spirituality, the transpersonal and so on, um, they, I think they, they tend to get squeezed into the scientific approach. And what I'm interested in is, is a broader approach. There are signs of that is also coming on board. And no, 10 years, another 10 years, who knows? Maybe students on this course will be leading that change. OK, I think uh, uh, we're finished. So thank you very much. Bye.